to put that. <laughs> well, that's going to look awkward, I guess. I didn't think about it. I could do the, I could do the throat deal. But I could hold it like this. I don't really know what to do, to be honest with you. I'm kind of excited. Sorry. But uh, good to see everybody. I'm glad you're here on a midweek uh, service. Uh, we're going to be in First Samuel in just a minute, First Samuel 26, and we'll continue on there. Uh, before we jump into uh, tonight's study, I uh, don't want to take just a moment and have a prayer together. Uh, as you're thinking uh, and as we're praying tonight, um, if you would re remember Gary uh, from, from the message uh, that was put on Facebook, he's back at Duke and he's been admitted, so please pray for, for them. He's having some real health issues right now. So, um, And also, please continue to remember Miss Sandra McMillan. She's still... And it's been kind of just a difficult recovery, so um, please pray for her and Jackie. Uh, what other prayer requests do y'all have? Anyone? All right. Go ahead. What do you think we need to be doing for the Millens or for Gary and them to help with the situation? As far as I know, just praying. Uh, from what I understand, I'm really, I don't as far as I know, there's not a need, a physical need there, um, um, but maybe just reaching out and calling, I think, would be good. Because I know they could both, Gary and Connie, could use encouragement. As, and uh, I know they all want to be here, Miss Sandra, too, if, if at all possible, but it's just been hard lately. All right. Uh, if you would, let's go to God in prayer. Our Almighty God and Father above, we thank you so much for your tremendous love, the way you bless us each day. We thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, for uh, this congregation, uh, for all the work that, that we do here together, for the opportunities you've given to us to serve. Father, please be with those on our prayer list so that we continue to remember and think about, uh, pray in a special way for, for Miss Sandra and, and for Gary and Connie and, and their health situations, Father. Pray that you bless them and be with them. Father, I pray that you be with those that maybe uh, uh, are on our hearts and minds but haven't been mentioned. Uh, Father, we pray that you'll continue to be with our congregation, that you'll help us in serving you. Father, we're also mindful of those who may be struggling with sin uh, or a spiritual issue uh, right now. We pray that you'll bless uh, You'll bless these individuals. We know you know the hearts and minds of each of us. And Father, we, we pray that if we can help in any way, that you'll use us to reach out and to uh, be a blessing uh, to these individuals and situations. Pray for those in Michigan who have suffered this great tragedy, um, for these families that have lost someone they love or been affected in, in a negative way. We, we pray for them, Father. Father, Please be with our study tonight as we are considering uh, the kings of Israel, uh, in specific uh, King Saul and King David and that transitional period. Father, we pray that you'll bless our study, that you'll bless our minds and hearts. Again, Father, uh, just so thankful for Jesus. And Father, it's in his name we offer this prayer. Amen. Again, good to see you tonight. Just a way of reminder, please don't forget Sunday, um, a special day for us here. We will uh, have our normal, uh, normal Sunday morning Bible class and worship services, but we will have a fellowship meal to follow. Uh, and as a part of that, uh, Doug has, has mentioned and, and, and uh, talked to us about the Magi boxes. Uh, the list uh, of needed items is in the foyer as well as some boxes, and we're going to spend some time that day filling them, making sure that we've done what we needed to to get those shipped out. So uh, if you have questions about that, uh, I'm sure Doug would love to help you out with that. And so, uh, and if I can in any way, I'll do that as well. But um, please be praying about that. All right, so let's jump into our study. 
Go in your Bibles to 1 Samuel 26. Um, as we move forward, we look back at last week. Um, in our last study, we noticed how David had uh, saved the people of Kela uh, uh, from the hand of the Philistines. We also noticed how David had to escape Saul in the wilderness of Maon. And so you have that kind of interesting interaction there. Um, uh, where they're on each side of a mountain and Saul leaves and gives David the, the freedom he needs to get away. Um, and then soon after that, David has an opportunity to kill Saul if he wanted to, but because David could never see himself putting his hand against the anointed of God, he spares Saul's life and cuts off the corner of that garment. Um, and then we also noted how Samuel died. And this is a big pivotal moment in the history of Israel. Uh, he is the last of the judges. And, and he, he uh, passes from this life on to his reward. Uh, and then finally we, we noted how uh, Abigail acted bravely and intelligently in saving her family. We also talked about the stupidity of Nabal and his own stubbornness led to his own death. Uh, and we talked about that. We also discussed how, uh, of course, after the death of Nabal, Abigail married, uh, married David along with um, oh, um, Ahiah. I'm ah, trying to remember how to pronounce her name. But he ended up marrying two ladies. Let me just say that. I'll refer you back to the text there. Uh, you can look back in Matthew, or 1 Samuel 25 for that. Ahayu, Ahayu, home. That's not right. Uh, but anyway, uh, so let's progress forward. In tonight's study, we're going to look at how David yet again has an opportunity uh, to take uh, Saul's life, but he chooses not to do that. He again spares Saul's life. Uh, we also see how David, after those events, will flee to the Philistines, amazingly enough, uh, for safety. Um, and uh, we'll also talk about uh, Saul in his uh, bout with sorcery, uh, how he seeks out a medium. Um, the Philistines, uh, as, as David grows in reputation there uh, with the king, the people still do not trust David and refuse to allow him to go into battle. We'll talk about maybe there may be some providence in that. And then... Uh, David, upon returning to where he's been living in Ziglag, um, he will find Ziglag burned to the ground and his family taken captive. And then finally, uh, we will get to the end of 1 Samuel where we will see how Saul's life ends at Mount Gilboa. All right, let's move on into uh, our study and looking forward here. Uh, let's go to chapter 26. Somebody read for us, please, those first two verses. And only one person can read. I know there's a lot here who want to read, and you're all ready. <laughs> the went to Saul at Gibeah and said, Is not David hiding on the hill of Hakalah, which faces Jeshimon? So Saul went down to the desert of Ziph with his 3,000 chosen men of Israel to search there for David. Saul made his camp beside the road of the hill of Hakalah facing Jesselon, but David stayed in the desert. When he saw that Saul had followed him there, he sent out scouts and learned that Saul had definitely arrived. All right, so let's um, look at where we are here. Now we're at the wilderness of Ziph, um, which is, so there's Ziph there. There's the wilderness of so David is somewhere in here. The Ziphites, I'm uh, going to turn him in uh, to Saul, um, maybe wanting to make favor with the king. And so uh, that's where Saul uh, goes to, to hunt out David. So uh, despite David, um, you know, not, not doing anything wrong, Saul is still, he has this really um, uh, anger and wrath toward David and he's seeking out of course his life you go down in the same text down to verse 5 uh, so Saul gets to Ziph 
Uh, verse 5 tells us, Then David rose and came to the place where Saul had encamped. So here is Saul, unbeknownst to him, has camped right outside of where David is hiding. He's a lot closer than Saul would have ever realized. Um, uh, so Saul, uh, so David comes to the place where Saul lay um, with Abner, the son of Ner, the commander of his army. Saul was lying within the encampment while the army was encamped around him. Now, once you think about what's going on here, this is really kind of amazing. So you got David and one of his men. They went down to this large encampment of men, large encampment, and to protect the king, what have they done? Yeah, so they have completely surrounded him. Soldiers on all sides. And, and even has the commander of his forces right beside of him. Yet David stealthily goes through the encampment, gets to where the king is, and takes his spear. That beloved spear he loves to throw so much. So, verse 7 uh, Jumping here ahead a little bit here, but uh, it says David and uh, Abashai uh, went to the army by night, and there lay Saul sleeping within the encampment with his spear stuck in the ground at his head. I'm telling you, he loves that spear. Like if you're wanting a Christmas gift for Saul, get him a spear, all right? Maybe with his name on it. He loves those spears. He's got the spear stuck in the ground right there. And so David and them, they come right there to where he is. Um, and uh, Abner was there. The army lay around him. You go on down in the context of verse 10. Uh, so, you know, his man's like, he's here. I'll run him through for you. We got him. Now, I don't think he really thought it through because you kill Saul, how are you going to get out of there? But I guess they're all sleeping through this anyway, so maybe they sleep through that too. But he's like, I'm going to do that. Well, what's David's reaction? Verse 10, yeah, he says no, basically, right? He says, as the Lord lives, the Lord will strike him. Now he does, he's, he's, by saying no, he's not saying Saul doesn't deserve to be punished. He's saying, I'm not going to do it. That's God's. Um, and so, uh, as the Lord lives, the Lord will strike him or his day will come to die. He will uh, go down into battle and perish. So he goes through all the different ways he's going to die. Uh, he may possibly die. But verse 11, the Lord forbid that I should put my hand against the Lord's anointed but take now the spear that is at his head and the jar of water and let us go. And so David's like, I'm not going to do that. I'm not his judge, basically. You know, it's kind of akin to what Paul says to the Romans, right? He says, what about vengeance? The vengeance, vengeance is God's, let him repay. All right, and so David, despite all of Saul's shortcomings, He's still the anointed king of Israel. And, and so he will not kill him in this way. And, and also, I'm sure in David's mind, that, that would be kind of a cowardly thing to do. Right? When he went against Goliath, what did he do? Face to face. Face to face, right? Yeah, he wasn't trying to strike him in the back. And, and so uh, he says, I won't do it. You go down to verse 12. Yes, sir. Just a quick, before you leave that first, did you think about the respect that David had for God's whatever, anointed, and you know, sometimes how impatient we can be with each other? Mm. Right? And I just think it's a great, and you know, we're not, we don't ever throw spears at each other. I mean, uh, you know, I just think that. Just says a lot about how important it is to respect God's children, His family. Uh, that's it. No, that's a great point. And and why did he respect Saul? 
right? Saul had not given him any personal reasons to respect him, but he respected him because God had appointed him. So really, in respecting Saul, who is David really showing respect toward? God, right? And going back to your point, you know, we may not throw literal spears, but we can figuratively throw spears at one another. And But we need to remember that every child of God belongs to God. Right? They're His. They wear His name. Now, in, a, in another way, every human being is God's. Um, but in even a more special way, every Christian is a child of God. And so I think it's a really good point. And so David refuses to lift his hand against one of God's anointed. It's really, to me, it's pretty special with it too. By this time, David's already been anointed king. Mm-hmm. So he knows that he's going to replace Saul. But it's just, I guess he, he talks there even about their, he, he's got a day. In God's mm-hmm. timing, there's a day. And David's patient enough to wait on God's timing instead of trying to take things into his own hand. He's already been anointed. He knows he's going to be king if you follow along with God's plan. And yet he's not going to take it at his time. He's waiting on God's time for that to happen. And that's another really good point is the patience of David. Like you say, Samuel, a man of God, has already anointed him king. He knows it's going to happen. But he's not trying to hurry it along, right? He's... And, and then when he says, you know, maybe it'll come from God, maybe God will just strike him down, maybe it'll come at old age, maybe it will come in war, battle, you know, it could come in any of those ways. But here he has an opportunity to kind of rush things along. And he says, no. But now, the other thing about that is, what would have happened had he stabbed him? Or had his man stab him? You're interfering with God's timing. It may end up costing you, right? Instead of being patient and letting God handle all this. Because God will handle it if David is patient. Well, yeah. The same kind of thing when David was going to avenge himself against Abigail. And mm-hmm. Abigail interceded. Mm-hmm. Do not do this. Do not avenge yourself. And then God struck the man dead. Yeah. Good point. Any other comments? Good points. All right. So, um, so here's David. <laughs> I can't imagine how nervous you'd be. <laughs> like you're looking for sticks, right? You ever try to be quiet? How difficult is it to be quiet when you're trying to be quiet? Like hunters, I'm amazed some of these guys get back in the woods and not make a sound, right? Uh, you know, uh, you think about maybe watching a movie or something, and you're watching these guys who are stealthy, right? Uh, maybe like a Navy SEAL who can come through the water and not make a noise, right? If I try to not make noise, I'm surely going to do something. Like you're, uh, you're late one night coming home, and your parents said you need to be back by 10, and you're back in at 10:30 or 11 or midnight, right? And there's always that one part of the floor that's like an alarm system, right? And it sounds off. Mom's probably already in the room waiting on you, right? Uh, I can't imagine what that must have felt like. They're in the middle of all these men. One man wakes up. One man gets uh, sleepless, all right? And you're sweating. Uh, but they, 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 they uh, leave that area. David says, just, we're going to take the spear, we're going to take the jar, and we're going to head out of here. Uh, verse 12, so they took the spear and the jar of water from Saul's head. Now what's the significance of the spear and the jar? Yeah. I want you to know how close I was to you. Just like with the corner of his garment, I want you to realize how close. Um, uh, it says, no man saw it or knew it, nor uh, did any awake, for they were all asleep because of a deep sleep. Notice from the Lord had fallen on them. Right? So God's providence at work here. Um, they get out. Uh, verse 13. Hey, Brian, sorry mm-hmm. you, but, oh no, go ahead. But on that, it'd be one thing if the Lord said, I want you to go in, don't harm Saul, but take the water and take the spear, and I'll cause a deep sleep. I don't think he did that. 
Right, so David had faith. Again, another, now we can see the providence of God working, but he doesn't know that the Lord's causing it. Like, to your point, he doesn't know how deep of a sleep these men are in. He's just, that's a lot of faith, but it's God working for David. Yeah, no indication in the text he was ever told any of that information, right? And we know there are other times when he just has to go to God and ask. Because right? he doesn't he's not given everything. And so I don't I don't see anywhere it indicates David knew God had caused a deep sleep on any of them. Oh. We all know that you know, God knows everything in his plans, you know, mm -hmm. but it is it's a way of not tempting but testing David too. Mm -hmm. Well, Yeah. Well, I think about Abraham with Isaac, right? You go and you study that, and one of the things is you ask, well, how could Abraham have actually done that? We go read the book of Hebrews. The Hebrews writer clears it up a little bit. What does it say about Abraham and Isaac's situation? Was, was Abraham willing to do all that he thought God intended? Yeah. Why was he able to do that? He said he didn't know how God would give Isaac back, but he knew he would because God had already promised. And so, I can't, I mean, that kind of faith, right? That's what we should aspire to. That's a, that's a high level, though. It's a high bar. And, and yet, again, here's another situation where a man of God has, has a choice to make. And he's choosing to obey when... Maybe he doesn't completely understand. You have something, Doug, you want to say? I, I was going to say, too, that David's been a warrior. He's been, he started out as a shepherd, keep a sheep and all that stuff, but he, he became a warrior <coughs> shortly after he started working with Saul. <coughs> Stealth, if you will, learning to be quiet, learning that, those, that, those are tactics a warrior can learn. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess myself in my life, I mean, Riding a submarine around the ocean. When we went, be silent. I mean, that's literally what it means. Be silent. I mean, a middle of hole going through. Sonar can be really sensitive. It can pick up all kinds. But it's you, you don't make a sound. You don't do anything because nobody, you know. And I mean, we in my time, right? We pulled right up alongside the ships, and they had no idea we're sitting right there. You know, underneath them, but that's yeah. inside. It, it's, a, it's a tactic. So I'm mm -hmm. thinking that David is a warrior. He was a guy. And if you, you consider American Indians, that's one of the greatest things that Native Americans had when those of us who were new here started coming. Uh, mm -hmm. American, you know, those Native Americans were really good about sneaking up on you. So yeah. just something to consider in this about how David his men got in there besides uh, giving a deep sleep. That it's, Warriors could work on tactics like that. And one, one final point. Let me make this and I'll come to you, Sandy. Um, you know, one other point about this. Saul had done everything he thought to protect himself. But we cannot protect ourselves from God. And I think we need to remember that. We, we can't, in other words, I can't hide away from God. And I think that's another lesson to learn here. Saul thought he's thought he was protected and he should have been any other situation one of those guys wakes up and says hey look somebody's in the camp shouldn't be here right and then they capture David and do whatever right but um, but you can't stop God yes ma'am Absolutely. And, you know, you think about uh, uh, Hananiah uh, uh, 
Azariah and Mishael, right? Those three who were facing a fiery furnace. What was their answer to the king? He says, God is able to save us. However, even if he chooses not to, I will not do it, right? And that's an amazing statement of faith. Uh, good points. Anything else? All right. So, um, let me find out where I am again. Uh, so David and, and, uh, and uh, his soldier leave. Um, verse 13, uh, when they had went over to the other side and stood far off on, on the top of the hill uh, with a great space between them, David called to the army and to Abner the son of Ner. Will you not answer, Abner? Uh, who, uh, and then Abner calls back, who, um, who are you who calls to the king? So, in, in a military kind of scheme, who's the guy really at fault here? Abner, right? Abner, you know, the old phrase, I think, was it Reagan who said the buck stops here? I'm not sure. Which president? One of them said that, right? He said the buck stops here. What, what does that mean? That phrase, the buck stops here. It's ultimately my responsibility. And if there's a failure, it really does fall on me. Right? And so at the heart of this, Abner, and that's why David calls out to him. Now, as he's calling, well, I'm jumping ahead. Um, verse 17, Saul recognizes David's voice. Now, how surprised is he? Here's this guy, I've been searching for him, and now he's calling out to me. And then it says um, there in verse 17, is this, uh, your, um, this, is this your voice, my son David? David said, it is my voice, my Lord, my O, o King. And he said, does my Lord pursue after his servant? For what have I done? What evil is on my hand? So David's steel is really not understanding why Saul is in such pursuit of him. Um, uh, David realizes he's not done anything to deserve this. And so you go on down verse 20 uh, in the text here. And um, so David is, is, is talking to him and he says, I'm going to back up here, it's not on the board, but in verse 19, Now therefore let my Lord, the king, uh, hear the word of his servant. If it is the Lord who has stirred you up against me, may he accept an offering. So is it God that's turned you against me? Has God told you something? Is there some, some way, what is David wanting to do? Repair the relationship he has with God. Maybe, maybe God is trying to punish him for something. So David is seeking some kind of restitution for that. You know, I think about uh, uh, Paul standing before uh, King Agrippa, you know, and he says, if I've done anything wrong, I, I'll, I'll serve my punishment, Acts 26. Of course, Paul knows he hasn't done anything, but he says, if I have, let me, I'll be punished. And, and so David here wants to repair his relationship with God. Is that what is... Uh, but if it is men, may they be cursed before the Lord. Maybe some of the men have stirred up Saul against David. Maybe they've been talking in his ear and trying to turn him against David. For they have driven me out this day that I should uh, have no share in the heritage of the Lord, saying, Go serve other gods. Now therefore, let not my blood fall uh, to the earth uh, from the presence of the Lord fall to the earth away from the presence of the Lord so David desperately wants what? clean of any conscience and he wants to be at home in Israel right he's been on the run running all this time he wants peace back in 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 the promised land in the land of God uh, that God gave to disciples or sons of Israel. Um, for the king of Israel has come to seek a single flea like one hunts a uh, partridge in the mountains. And so David feels like 
You know, he's being hunted, and he is. And so you go on in the context here in verse 21. Let's see, there was something. So if you go back up, and I, I kind of skipped over this, but in 13 following, David explains, you know, we were right there. Now I can't imagine how shocked Saul must have felt, right, that he was right there, that he had the spear. Um, and so what's Saul's reaction? Now we've said this before, Saul often responds in the right way when it's too late. Notice his reaction in verse 21. How does he react? He finally admits it. I've sinned, right? He's been led in the wrong direction. Now, unfortunately for Saul, it's like, it's like this just series of, of times when he, 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 he makes, you know, says the right thing about repenting, and then it's just like he falls right back into it. And that's what he's going to do again. But here he says, I have sinned. Return my son, David, for I will... Um, for I will no more do you harm. Yes, ma'am. I think we've said this before, but, you know, Saul and David, this, the words, I mean, there's, this, there's a lot of, they're yelling at each other. Mm -hmm. So if Saul and David can hear each other, all the men can hear them too. I think, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't believe what he said. Mm -hmm. It's like he's, he could, he's not asking God for God's forgiveness. He's hollering so everybody can hear. Yeah. And, and Saul has been trying to keep his reputation with all his men. I imagine you try to think of what they are thinking as they hear this. You know, and he asked David, he says, return. Now, is David going to return? I mean, he's had three, three spears thrown at him already. I mean, <laughs> it's going to be a little bit before I trust you enough, you know, uh, sleeping with eyes wide open, right? I wonder. You may, I wouldn't give it back. Um, yeah. What was, what was the funny line from President Bush? He, he, he tried to quote that one time and he got all fumbled. Y'all should look that up. It's really funny. And he, he messes it up and realizes he messes it up and he messes it up more. It's hilarious. Um, you fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. It won't happen a third time, right? Uh, but... Uh, and so David won't, but but he does say, you know, I've sinned, uh, I've uh, I've done wrong. He says, uh, behold, I have acted foolishly. End of verse twenty-one, um, and have made a great mistake, and he has. Uh, but like you say, I mean, David is not going to trust him. Uh, David, um, Saul ends up saying in verse twenty-five, "Blessed be you, uh, my son David." And notice what he says. You will do many things and will succeed in them. And so David went his way and Saul returned to his place. And so they, they amicably at least sort of separate. And David will leave here. He will go over to the Philistines and end up settling in uh, Ziglag um, as we move on. Any questions, any other comments, questions about that section? Chapter 26. Yes, ma'am. So when he threw the spears, it talks about him having that that evil kind of spirit or whatever that was come on him. Now these times it's not like that because this is more like uh, planned out. It's more like it's not just a momentary just action, right? Uh, somebody gets mad and hits somebody, right? There, that's one thing. It's another thing to get mad at somebody and do something like you saw in Michigan, the sad, sad, tragic event, right? There's a, there's a, there's a sinful, evil quality to that that's just more, 
right? Uh, that, that it's more sinister. Um, and, and, and anyone can recognize that. That's why premeditated murder, right, carries a longer sentence. Um, uh, because, you know, there is something more evil about that. Any other questions, comments? And along that, I think it's important for us to ask ourselves, you know, on a regular basis is, am I ready to face God right now? <laughs> you know, and if that, that answer is no, I'm not, then I ought to really think about my life. Um, and David, you know, in verse 23, knows, you know, he feels confident or he feels assured that in that moment he could face God. Um, and Saul doesn't, right? And that's why he says, I've sinned. Good comments. All right, so who are the Philistines? Well, they're the dreaded enemy of the Israelites, aren't they? Well, interestingly enough, David goes to the Philistines to seek out safety. Go to chapter 27. Uh, somebody read those first four verses, please. Then David said to himself, Now I will perish one day by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me than to escape into the land of the Philistines. Saul then will despair of searching for me anymore in all the territory of Israel, and I will escape from his hand. So David arose and crossed over, he and the six hundred men who were with him, to Achish, the son of Baoch, king of Gath. And David lived with Achish at Gath, he and his men, each with his household, even David with his two wives, Ahinoam and the, the Jezreelitess, and Abigail the Carmelitess, Nabal's widow. Now it was told Saul that David had fled to Gath, so he no longer stretched search for him. So, like we mentioned before, David still doesn't feel safe with Saul, and rightly so. Um, and so he decides he's going to go over to, uh, to the Philistines in uh, Philistia, and so he is going to uh, leave here, and he's going to travel across uh, Israel to Gath. Okay, And who's the king in Gath? Ask Achish or Achish, All right? Achish is the king of Gath. Now, um, it's interesting that he goes there. That's his bitter enemy. Uh, but again, I believe the providence of God that he's able to go there and find safety. But now the king says, uh, um, you can't stay here. And so David asks for somewhere that he can go and they'll, they'll be where they are, and they'll, they're not going to interfere. And so the king says, okay, you can go down to Ziglag. So he's going to travel down from Gath to uh, Ziglag here, and they're going to live there. Um, and David, while he's there, uh, the text tells us in verse 7 that he's going to be here a little while, a year and a half, or a year and four months, uh, about a year and a half. He's going to be uh, with the Philistines. Um, and dwell there. Now, while he's there, he's going to do some raiding. Um, he miss and he's going to mislead the king and to what he's actually raiding against. The king's going to believe he's been raiding against the Israelites, and he's not. Um, he he makes mention, I believe, is what it tells us. He's going to come down into the Negeb uh, here and raid. That's not what he does. Uh, he raids um, in different in, in the areas more. Uh, I guess that would be to the west. Um, and so the king's going to, he's going to find favor with the king. 
First, uh, if we go to chapter 28 and verse 1, it says, In those days the Philistines gathered uh, their forces for war to fight against Israel. And Achish said to David, Understand that you and your men are to go out to war with me uh, in the army. So Achish thinks, Well, I've got this great fighting force, David and his 600, and I'm just going to use them in battle along with my men. That's Achish's plan. Um, it won't be the army's plan. We'll come back to that in a little bit. So they're going to go and make war against Israel. And David says in verse 2, Very well, you shall know that uh, know what your servant uh, can do. And Achish said to David, Very well, I will make you my bodyguard for life. Now, what an amazing turn of events. It wasn't that long ago. David was fighting against the Philistines. And now they made Achish... He has such a trust level with David, he's made him his own bodyguard. Now, what we'll find out is David doesn't actually go to battle with them. And we'll come back to this. And I believe there's a little bit of providence of God in that because of what's going to happen in the valley of Jezreel uh, with Saul. So, that's where David is. Well, where's Saul in chapter 28? In just a couple minutes we got, I just will start this section. I don't know if we have time. We might be able to get through it all. Uh, so, Saul, what's he doing? Saul, you imagine being Saul. He's a lost man at this point. He doesn't, he, he, he's a doomed man. He knows it. So, who would he normally go to to seek out advice? Samuel. There's a big problem there. What is it? He's dead. So what's he going to do? Well, most people would find another advisor, right? Not Saul. I'll find another way. I'm going to go to that special phone call, that special phone line, and I'm going to call Saul. Or call Samuel. Saul's going to call. That's a different show, I think. Uh, but uh, so uh, we find out in verse 3, before Samuel died, what... Um, I'm sorry, um, so Samuel has died, and after his death, what had Saul done? Got rid of, which he should have done, right? That's an act, act, righteous act. He got rid of all the sorcerers. Well, maybe, that, maybe he felt like that was hasty. So, he needs an advisor, he needs help. So what does he do? Verse 5, when Saul saw the army of the Philistines. So now the Philistines are coming against him. As we mentioned, when he is confessing to David, I've sinned, who heard him? His armies, all his men. How do you think the confidence level was? We run polling all the time in America. We do presidential and Senate and, and all these different polls, right? Why do we do that? We're gauging the level of popularity or acceptance or approval of something or someone. I think if you've done a poll at that time of Saul, it's probably not going to be very high. He's probably going to run in the 30s, right, or lower. And, and so he sees the armies of Philistines coming, and he was afraid, verse 5. Notice again the difference in the heart of Saul and David, right? David faces an enemy like Goliath. He doesn't fear because he knows God will support him. God will win the battle if he, if he is faithful. And his heart trembled greatly when Saul, and when Saul inquired of the Lord, notice this. Now at least in this moment, he finally learns to go to God. But again, Saul learns stuff too late. He's too prideful. He humbled himself too late. And what happened? God refused to answer. What does Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 say? He begins by saying, God's ear is not short that it cannot hear, his hands not or, sorry, his hands not slack, it cannot save, his ears not too short, that it cannot hear. However, what? Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear you. Saul has done nothing with the sin problem. 
he still got, he, there's still sin between him and God. And so God doesn't answer him in dreams or by Urim or by the prophets. So Saul says, is that the second bell? All right. We'll stop there because I don't want to dive any deeper. I'm sorry. <laughs> we were just there. See, that's a cliffhanger. So you come back next Wednesday and we'll begin right there. So that's like the next episode you're waiting to see, right? Like when uh, Amazon's about to drop a new series and they're, each episode you anticipate greatly. But uh, I'll see you next week. Read the, read the last, uh, these last three chapters of, of Samuel, 1 uh, Samuel, and we'll dive into those next week. Thank you so much. Thank you for your participation.